Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition. This is my play-by-email game with XTRG, and in today's video we're going to do something a little bit different with regards to the combat results. Uh, I've gotten some feedback that basically says, hey, you should really consider uh, doing live reactions to the combat results. So uh, in this video, we're going to do that. I'm going to kind of talk through the combat results as they occur. Uh, this is the first time that we've tried that, and it is December 22nd. As a reminder, we're in the process of trying to get the Prince of Wales out. Uh, the Prince of Wales is down here, I think, near north of Banka. And uh, it is, I think, gotten out of the range of uh, Japanese air cover. So it should be home free, but it definitely has severe damage and flooding uh, that uh, needs to contend with. And if it runs into a submarine, then obviously that'll be a challenge as well. Meanwhile, we're trying to get some troops in place for a landing on Canton. That probably won't happen this turn. We're trying to run our aircraft carriers east. That probably also, uh, you know, won't lead to anything this turn. And I don't expect a ton to go on this turn, except, uh, did that submarine just fire two sets of torpedoes? He just fired eight. He just fired another set of torpedoes. Good God. Oh, there he got a hit. Okay, well, I-18 um, at least used 12 torpedoes, I think, on the eight. Another set of torpedoes and another miss. Wow. I Oh, my God. Another set of torpedoes. Well, he's finally getting some hits on. There's multiple hits coming on this set. But he fired, what, like 16 or 7, 16, 18? I don't know, however many torpedoes. He's probably out of torpedoes. I'm glad, you know, if this submarine wants to sink one ship every time it comes out and then has to go all the way back to Japan or perhaps now Midway, now that uh, XTRG has taken Midway, um, you know, I can live with that. I think that's the biggest consequence of our loss, and that ship sinks, obviously. Got hit by three torpedoes, but, you know, y you, I think, were... Oh, no! Temporary flotation repairs are failing aboard the Prince of Wales. We're going to have to see what the flooding status is uh, next turn. I think it was 81 or 51 last turn, so it hadn't suffered any flood damage. Although it also told us previous turn that flooding repairs were failing, so... Uh, and it didn't go up at all, so maybe our pumps just kept up with things. Um, I'm not sure. Meanwhile, uh, some more of our submarines here are being attacked by Japanese uh, depth charges. Uh, we can see here they're missing or maybe hitting. Uh, looks like mostly missing the USS Seawolf off the coast of Malaya so far. Uh, oh, shit. Severe damage. Damage to engines. It's taking on water. Well, we're going to have to see what that means. I really would prefer not to lose an another fucking one. Good God. Side penetrated. Taking on water. Uh, I think we've lost one submarine so far. He's also lost one submarine. It doesn't say heavy damage, so that's good. But um, his anti-submarine tactics have been very effective, I will say. Mine have not, uh, with the exception of the one sub that we caught near... I think it was near Singapore, and we forced it to surface, and then we destroyed it with gunfire. But... Um, it's been a little bit frustrating. We've had at least four or five subs badly damaged, so they're either moving back to port or are currently under repair. I think we have one that's almost finishing up repair at Manila, and then I think we've got one that'll be done in about two days at uh, Singapore, actually. But um, and, and that's one of those situations where those shipyards that you have far forward at those uh, sort of uh, bases you're bound to lose is at least useful in the sense that D.D. Yungi's reported hit. Did uh, R.C plane just drop a bomb on that damaged destroyer uh, but that's one of the rare you know the one of the examples of uh, the rare times where those forward sea uh, sort of shipyards can actually be very useful although I guess you could say the same thing about the Prince of Wales we didn't put it in the shipyard but still the, the large facilities at Singapore saved the Prince of Wales no doubt uh, at least for the time being until we figure out if we can get her out or not. I'd like to get her to Colombo, but that's a long voyage over open waters. It might be a better idea, or not Colombo, uh, to South Africa. Might be a better idea to try and go for uh, for Colombo in, in Sri Lanka, but I don't like the idea of leaving it in the Indian Ocean at a place that, frankly, if he wants to raid it with his uh, Kidu Butai, he definitely would be able to. And the problem is the Prince of Wales is probably going to take like a year to repair maybe a little more with the massive amount of damage it has, so I don't want it to be in a place where he can reach out and touch me. Uh, meanwhile, you can see here there's a lot of bombing going on here in China. We're going to fast forward here. They're 
attacking some isolated troops here near Haikau. You can see they did 238 casualties worth of damage, all non-combatant troops. A second raid of Sally's is coming in. We're going to fast forward through that as well. Another 46 casualties, mostly disabled troops, not destroyed. Um, a lot of recon going on. Uh, some recon over ranting. Meanwhile, I don't think he realizes this, but we actually have snuck three or four AKLs, so small coastal cargo ships, with about 4,000 supplies into Bataan and started unloading that last turn. I think we'll probably finish that off this turn. Um, and that's, you know, all the supply we can sneak into the Philippines, the better, because at the end of the day, usually Bataan falls due to lack of supply. Um, eventually it'll get kind of beat down, bombarded, and when you've got no additional supply coming in, uh, that's problematic. Now, one of the things that negates that a little bit is the fact that uh, the uh, base is too small to prevent spoilage, so there's only so much supply you can fit there and you lose some inefficiencies there, but um, nonetheless, uh, any supply we can force in there is, is a positive, I think. Uh, he just ran a fighter suite with some Oscars over uh, Cheng Chao, which is something we should keep in mind. We have um, a Flying Tiger squadron here. Uh, we stood them down uh, this turn because their fatigue was over 30, which if they had been engaged by enemy fighters with fatigue over 30, they probably would have been ravaged. So lucky that we stood them down. I haven't seen a bombing raid on Cheng Chao yet, so really fortunate. As much as I can, I would rather never uh, send my fighters up to uh, engage his fighters in a fighter battle, I would much rather just uh, send my fighters after his bombers at this stage in the war when our aircraft are so inferior. Meanwhile, he's really bombing heavy in uh, China here, bombing north of Fuzhou. Um, again, he's hitting an individual core there, disabling some of the troops. Recon over Kuatan, recon over Chengchao, over Johor Bahru. Japanese are reconning Yicheng, which we just took back the other turn from them. And I think there was a fair bit of supplies in there, because all of my troops who were badly out of supply are all in supply now that they uh, took the base. The base is still flagged as low on supply, but uh, I think that's because the units consumed or are in the process. You get Supply gets allocated to units, and then you have what's left over in the stockpile. So I think whatever was in the stockpile got allocated. Um, the Seawolf's temporary flooding is, is failing, so that means the Seawolf obviously took some serious damage, I think. Uh, we'll have to see how she is next turn. We'll probably have to pull her back, maybe to Singapore as well, to see if we can try and repair her. As long as he doesn't keep bombing Singapore, that shipyard's going to be very valuable and kind of cranking my subs back out. Meanwhile, we're into the land combat phase. This seems to be somewhat of an anticlimactic turn in terms of naval air, air action, which I'm fine with at this stage in the war. He's attacking a core of ours that's to the west of Chuisin. He obviously succeed, succeeded in pushing it back, 9 to 1 odds. Uh, 600 assault versus, we only had 69. Um, you can see here that the Japanese ground losses were 374 with one squad destroyed. Ours were 2010 with 89 squads destroyed in combat, 99 non-combatant, 10 engineers, two, 5 guns, 1 unit retreated. So that was, that was pretty rough. That was a, a rough handling of that Chinese core. Meanwhile, he's attacking at Batangas, which is just to the south of Manila. Uh, we have a armored unit here, the 194th Tank Battalion and the 71st Filipino Infantry Division going up against two uh, infantry regiments, a recon regiment and an engineer regiment. Their, uh, hit, their attack value exceeds ours by about 2 to 1, but uh, looks like they pushed us back. So the 7th uh, Filipino Infantry Division retreats to Manila. Interesting that the armor retreated in a different direction. So I'm just going to imagine on like a Atlas map, they split our units in two, and one was pushed one way, the other, or the other. They got four to one combat odds. A little bit discouraging there. They weren't. I mean, there was closer to two to one uh, when you before you factor in uh, the modifiers here. You know, we didn't have any fort level, which hurt. Uh, Japanese capture Batangas. Uh, defender preparation negative. Experience negative. Attacker no negatives or positives. You can see here the Japanese lost 289 casualties, 23 squads disabled, two uh, non-combats disabled, two engineers. We lost 822 men, 64 squads destroyed. Uh, obviously, those can't be replenished. Uh, we also lost 41 vehicles, 36 destroyed, and 17 guns. So we didn't really buy any time there. Um, meanwhile, they're attacking at Sabi. You can see their unit has 53 attack value. Uh, doesn't look like it dropped quite a bit down to 34, so they were at least disrupted there. Uh, but they did take this uh, island of Savi, which is in the Samoa group, 
11 to 1. Uh, we lost three Catalinas that couldn't fly out. He lost 35 troops, six squads disabled. Um, we lost 236 troops, four squads destroyed, seven non-combatants. Uh, but frankly, three, six squads disabled by that unit. Good job, guys. You did uh, about as good as we could probably hope there. Uh, meanwhile, we're bombarding at Mersing. We have two brigades, two Indian brigades, which have arrived to reinforce. Uh, so we were bombarding his troops there. Doesn't look like we're really doing any damage with our bombarding. Uh, his uh, attack value isn't dropping at all. Ours dropped a tiny bit. Yeah, okay. So attacking force, attack value 332. His is 87. So we could potentially do a deliberate or an assault next turn and see how things play out. Um, but uh, yeah. I think that's going to do it for the combat results, guys. So I'm going to jump back out, and when I come back, it'll probably be, uh, well, in, in my real time, it'll probably be about a day, and I will have uh, issued my orders, and I'll talk through those. Um, I'll try to give an update on my carrier air wings. I know that was something that was requested. And then I'll also try to give an update in the next video, not this one, but the following one, on our production cues and, and kind of where we're at there. Uh, with that being said, uh, I'll catch you guys on the other end of the break. I should really insert a commercial here. Maybe I will. I've never done that before. I've never done mid-roll ads. But, you know, it helps the channel if you guys watch those things. And if not, you know, whatever. It's up to you. All right, guys. All right, and we're back here. Uh, we just completed the combat results, and now uh, I'm actually recording this a couple of days later because XTRG gave me the combat results before uh, my turn. Um, but returning to this episode here, uh, you can see our carriers are just east of Canton. In my last uh, video, I, I got asked to take a look at the carrier air groups. So we will do that here real quick before we look at the rest of what we're going to do for our turn. What I will say is after issuing the orders, I'm pretty excited about this turn. I really am curious how it's going to play out in our next episode because there's a lot going on here and a lot of it is not anything I planned in some sort of grand master stroke. These are just some opportunistic uh, moves that I'm going to make. There was one thing that I think was in the making, but uh, we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, as I said, the request was to take a look at the carrier air groups. So first off, the Allies have six, have three fleet carriers right now. The American fleet carriers, the USS Lexington, uh, the Saratoga, and the Enterprise. Um, so the Lexington and Saratoga are battle cruiser conversions, and the Enterprise is a carrier is a purpose built aircraft carrier. Um, I do want to call out here that we will be getting a new carrier soon. So the USS Yorktown, the first of the Yorktown class, uh, or actually it was the Enterprise of Yorktown. Let's take a look. The Enterprise might have been the Yorktown. It is. Okay. So the Yorktown, uh, which is the uh, lead ship in the class of its name, will be coming available in seven days. Um, and then in about two and a half months, we'll be getting the Hornet, which I think that's another Yorktown, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then those are the only two carriers we're going to get in the next two and a half months. So the only carriers we're going to get before uh, what was the historical battle of uh, Midway. Uh, the Wasp comes later. But we will be getting the Hornet in about a week, and then we'll have four fleet carriers to the Japanese six. When we get the Hornet, that'll be nice, but the Japanese are getting two new fleet carriers in a relatively short period of time as well. So kind of a, kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Uh, we will get the Hornet in, uh, or sorry, we'll get the Wasp by June of 42, and that'll be the last carrier that we get before 1943. So there's a bit of a lull there before the Essex class carriers start coming online. Um, but... Uh, I was asked about the carrier air groups, so let's take a look at that. Uh, the best carrier that we have, in my opinion, uh, just because everybody loves the name and because the, the commander is Vice Admiral William Bull Halsey, the famous carrier commander, although I would argue Spruance was actually better. Um, he commands the USS Enterprise Task Force, uh, as well as um, Captain Murray. G.D. Murray is the captain of the Enterprise. This is the Enterprise you can see here. It's got 5-inch guns, 1.1-inch uh, AA guns, uh, 50 caliber machine guns, and it's got radar. Uh, there will be an upgrade that'll come, which will add some 20mm Orlicons, which I believe add quite a bit of firepower to the AA battery. The 20mm Orlicons are kind of the bofers. I, well, are those 40 millimeters? I don't know. The 20 millimeters are really sort of the iconic. The 20 millimeters and the 5 inch anti aircraft guns are sort of the iconic anti aircraft guns of the Allies. And they get 24 of these when the upgrade occurs. Um, 
you can see their anti-aircraft fire goes to 828. It's currently 600, so that's all, more than a 30% increase in the anti-aircraft gun. That happens in April of 1942. But looking at the air group here, there are four squadrons in every one of the American fleet carriers. Uh, there's generally one fighter squadron, two dive bomber squadrons, and one torpedo bomber squadrons. The Japanese carriers, I believe, typically have three, one of each, so one fighter, one dive bomber, one torpedo. The Japanese were more reliant on their torpedo bombers because they had a fantastic aerial torpedo, which meant that their torpedoes were more deadly than their dive bombers. Their dive bombers weren't bad planes, they were actually very good planes, but the problem was the, the Val dive bomber, which was their early war dive bomber, only carried a 250 kilogram bomb, whereas the U.S. dive bombers, the SBD Dauntlesses, uh, actually could carry a thousand pound bomb or a 500 pound bomb. The thousand pound bomb are ship killers. Um, you know, usually you think of torpedoes as ship killers. Uh, in the American case, they had an excellent dive bomber in the Dauntless. The Devastator was not a terrible torpedo plane, but it was definitely hamstrung by a terrible torpedo. Uh, which I don't think ever hit a moving target, at least never hit a moving uh, carrier target. Um, they, these things were just obliterated at Midway. I think there, there was a squadron of 16 planes that lost every single plane or every plane but one. Um, and you can see here it's the Mark 13 aerial torpedo, which I'm not sure if it's an aerial version of the Mark 14 or not. Uh, but in any event, it's a bad torpedo. It sucks. Uh, but they can be used for bombing, too, which isn't a, a terrible thing to do. So back to the air wing. So we've got VF-6, which is our fighter squadron on the Enterprise. Uh, you can see here it consists of 23 F-4F Wildcats, uh, the F-4F-3A variant. Um, it can have up to 27 uh aircraft in the squadron. We have an aircraft production uh, constraint, and we'll take a look at that in our next episode. Uh, we'll take a look at our production pool, which is pitiful for the Allies at this stage. But um, one of the main issues with the Allies early on is just a lack of quality airframes, and the F-4F is no exception. You really have a very low production rate, which means you have to be very careful with your uh, usage of your carriers because you can get your air wings shot up and in a situation where it takes three or four months before you can use your carriers again. Um, obviously better than getting your carrier sunk, but still something you have to contend with. The American experience in these squadrons is actually pretty good, which reflects sort of the more, I don't know if elite is the right word, but the better uh, sort of quality around the American aviators on naval, uh, naval ships. Um, you can see here we've got several pilots with 70 plus experience um, and then only a couple who have below 50. I haven't messed with any of the air wings yet. I haven't started my training program. Uh, you can see Lieutenant Commander uh, McCluskey is the commander of this squadron. I thought, wasn't he the commander of one of the dive bombing squadrons that uh, uh, hit Midway? I know he was at Midway. Uh, anyway, then we have two uh, dive bomber squadrons. We have a VS-6 and we have VB-6. Both Dauntless dive bomber squadrons. Both consist of 18 Dauntless dive bombers. The Dauntless, we have a little bit more in terms of supply. We've got 22 in the pool. So we've got uh, a more reasonable supply of Dauntlesses, but still, uh, you will suffer if you lose too many of them early on with some early war attrition issues. Likewise, a reasonable experience quota. None of these experience levels for your pilots uh, can hold a candle to the Japanese carrier aviators, but they're still not bad. They're not terrible. Um, they definitely would do with some seasoning, though. Um, so you can see here, this is uh, VS-6 with LT Gallagher, uh, one of the commanders, another historical pilot. And again, every single crew member is experienced above 60, so uh, a quality squadron there. Uh, VB-6 is another Dauntless squadron, another full-size squadron on the Enterprise 18 aircraft, and another 68 uh, level experience unit uh, with no pilots below 65. So again, overall quality squadron led by LT Best. Lieutenant Commander Lindsay leads the uh, the Devastator Squadron, which consists of 15 torpedo bombers. Uh, there are six in the pool. You've got a few Devastators to spare. Uh, they're an old, slow aircraft. It might have been the Navy's first monoplane. I'm not sure. Um, but the, the Americans would have been better off with the Swordfish as their torpedo bomber. Unfortunately, I don't have the ability to switch to the tor to the um, to the Swordfish. Uh, it's just the Avenger models, which come later, which will be a tremendous torpedo bomber. Um, so that is the USS Enterprise. It consists of a total of 74 aircraft, 
Up to 90 aircraft can be fit on the air, on the uh, ship. Uh, the Enterprise carries 26 aerial torpedoes. So you can see here the Devastators, we have 15 of them. Theoretically, we could launch two full strikes, two full deck loads of Devastators. So one raid and then maybe the next day another raid or maybe in the PM. And then after that, we would only have six torpedoes left. So only about half of our Devastators could carry torpedoes. In terms of its um, sortie limit, it has 74 aircraft. Uh, its sortie limit, which basically means like the number of uh, aircraft uh, flights that can occur before the uh, planes need, or before the ship needs to head in to uh, get resupplied, is 534. Uh, which, if you figure that by the number of aircraft on board, um, that means that every aircraft can, because we've got 74, every aircraft can conduct 7.2 sorties. Now, I don't know if combat air patrols count against the sorties or if it's just offensive action. I'm guessing it's offensive action because we do have orders for naval search for several of these squad or several of these units. All of my dive bombers and devastators have a 30% naval search order. So 30% of the squadron will be sent out on naval search in a given day, or at least that's the order. And then we've got a 40% cap over the uh, air group. If we thought that we were going into battle in the next day or two, we'd probably jack that cap up to 60 or 70% and we'll allow the remaining 30 to act as escorts. Um, but in the meantime, in the interest of keeping fatigue low, uh, we keep it a little bit lower. Um, so that's the USS Enterprise. And again, that is... Um, the first of our uh, carriers uh, and probably the best of our carriers. If we actually look at the Enterprise itself, uh, its crew is, well, its leader is a level 71 uh, leadership, 67 inspiration, 59 naval, 67 air. So a pretty darn good commander. Uh, and then again, the fleet is uh, the squadron or the task force is commanded by William Bull Halsey, a vice admiral. Um, the experience levels are actually kind of poor. Daylight fighting, 55. Nighttime fighting, 37. Moving on to the next task force in this group, the USS Saratoga. Again, a very similar makeup. Uh, actually, this one is one additional squadron. So this, wow. Okay, the Saratoga has a lot of aircraft. It actually has more than its maximum stack limit. This is weird. I didn't realize that. Okay. So the Saratoga has two fighter squadrons. It has VF-3 uh, with 27 F4F Wildcats. Uh, it is a level 65 experience. It is led by Lieutenant Commander Thatch, who is famous for his development of the Thatch Weave, which was a tactic that was used by F4F Wildcats to deal with the superior maneuverability of the Zero, wherein they would sort of, uh, multiple F4Fs would kind of turn in on each other and kind of weave back and forth so that the Zero would, would uh, I don't really know the details of it, but I know it's kind of like a series of turns um, where they kind of, turn the zero back in on itself and uh, don't allow it to have the advantage of maneuverability. Don't allow it to get into a sort of a one-on-one -a -on -one dogfight situation. And it was very effective. And the Thatch Weave actually had a, a, a engagement at Midway where I think a outnumbered group of F4Fs uh, were able to inflict uh, something like two or three to one casualties on the Japanese with the F4F uh, and uh, following the Thatch Weave. So uh, Lieutenant Commander Thatch, uh, a very strong um, uh, squadron leader. You can see here we do have a few lesser experienced. We even have an ensign with less than 50 experienced in the squadron. But again, Thatch himself is 81. E.H. Uh, O'Hare, Lieutenant J.G. O'Hare, was actually historically the Navy's first ace. Uh, he shot down five aircraft before uh, disappearing in a night engagement, uh, I believe during the Marshall Raids. Uh, where he was one of the few pilots that was up trying to shoot down enemy GM uh, three and four bombers coming at the fleet in night, uh, and he kind of just disappeared. But uh, O'Hare, you may know, has O'Hare Airport named after him, um, just as uh, as there's actually quite a few airports around the United States uh, named after aviators. Uh, in Milwaukee, uh, Mitchell Field is the main airport named after Billy Mitchell, of course. Um, but uh, O'Hare uh, is another quality aviator. Thatch, wow, an 81 experience. That's like Japanese level good. Um, okay, so that's the uh, VF-3. Two more Dauntless Squadrons, VS-3 and VB-3. Um, 61 and 64 experience, both fully maxed out. And then the 18 F4, F2A-3 Buffaloes of VMF-221, uh, which is a Marine Squadron. 
which is carrier capable stationed on the Sar- Saratoga. So they're carrier capable. They're not carrier trained. I don't know if these guys were supposed to be shuttled somewhere. Maybe we were supposed to shuttle them to Midway, but they were on the. These. This must be some kind of shuttle group. They're not intended to fly off the carrier so much as they are. Uh, intended to go somewhere. So that actually brings up an interesting point. Since I've got these aircraft, they're not really part of the air wing. They're not carrier trained. So if we try and operate them off of the carrier, they will suffer horrendous operational losses. Maybe what I do is when I get over towards Savi, I'll drop those buffaloes either on Pago Pago or on uh, or on Fiji itself, and then we can uh, strengthen the land force there without actually, uh, you know, having to commit the carrier air wings themselves uh, to destruction. That's a pretty intriguing idea. Now, granted, the Buffalo kind of sucks. I'm guessing they were actually being transferred to, to Midway because there were no fighters on Midway, but at the Battle of Midway, there were Buffaloes based there, so um, that might be where they were going. I would much rather have them convert to the F4, F3 Wildcat, but um, I don't think, I don't think, we, well, I mean, we definitely don't have enough to upgrade them. So I think we'll move that uh, that squadron over to Savi or to uh, Pago Pago, one of the two. All right, sorry guys, I might be sneaking a yawn or two here uh, in I'm recording at uh, 2.30 in the night. Uh, It is uh, 13 degrees outside, so I'm braving the elements to bring this next episode to you. Uh, But that's the Saratoga. And then the third and final carrier that we have is the Lexington. Uh, She also has a Marine squadron on her. This one is a dive bomber squadron. It's VMSB-231, another Marine squadron, uh, consisting of the SB-2U Vindicator which is a, the predecessor to the Dauntless Dive Bomber. Uh, this one is, the uh, again, the predecessor toward it. It carries a 1,000-pound bomb and a 500-pound bomb. Not nearly as good of an aircraft historically. Uh, looks really weird and long, but hey, maybe it's something worth dropping onto a base somewhere and uh, you know giving the Japanese something to think about. Because, again, they're carrier-capable, but they're not carrier-trained. They're marine aviators. They're not naval aviators. In addition to that, we have VF-2, VS-2, and VB-2, as well as VT-2. So again, one fighter squadron, two dive bomber squadrons, and one torpedo bomber squadron. The uh, fighter squadron, unfortunately, consists of uh, buffaloes, which we don't have enough aircraft to replace yet. Uh, It's a little bit undersized, so we might want to consider increasing the number of aircraft in the unit. There's 22, 19 ready, 3 in maintenance. So if we wanted to add 5, we could do that. Interestingly enough, is even with the 18 uh, Vindicators, we actually have some capacity on the carrier. We can have up to 90 aircraft. We have 88, um, which is kind of interesting because... If you compare the Enterprise, the Enterprise can... Oh, actually, it could carry 90 aircraft as well. All right, well, I guess they can all carry 90 aircraft then. Um, The Saratoga is over its limit, though. It has 96 out of 90. Uh, So maybe we'll drop those. So here's the other thing is we've also got a Marine F4F and Dauntless Squadron en route to Pago Pago. So we could uh, put them all on Fiji, and if the Japanese come at Fiji, then they would have essentially 30 modern, no, 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 the Buffalo is not modern, but they'd have 30 fighters to deal with without risking our fighter aviation on our carriers to destruction, as well as some 40 dive bombers, the 18 Vindicators, uh, the 18 Dauntlesses, uh, and then there's uh, some Vincents uh, on the island as well um, that they would have to deal with. So that would be an intriguing, uh, an intriguing thought. Uh, something to again, it's not going to defeat the uh, Kitty Butai, but it might keep some of the pressure off of our ground troops just a little bit, ever so slightly, or at least cause the Japanese to eat up supply in uh, in sorties to suppress the airfield first before they turn their attention to our ground units. Worth considering. Um, so Lexington, as we said, those four squadrons. Uh, they've got Lieutenant Commander Brett in command of the torpedo bombers. Lieutenant Commander Hamilton is one of the dive bomber squadrons. Lieutenant Commander Dixon, who is also at the Battle of Midway, uh, one of the other dive bomber squadrons. And Lieutenant Commander Ramsey is leading the Buffalo Fighter Squadron. Um, okay. So that's our carrier air wings. Those are the three over here. And then if we take a look at the new carrier that's currently being built, 
the USS Yorktown. That will also come with four squadrons, uh, one fighter, two dive bomber, one torpedo bomber. Uh, you can see here it's going to come with 17 F4F Wildcats for free, so we don't have to wait for them to actually be built. That's nice. Um, and then we'll have maxed out squadrons for the Dauntlesses and then a slightly understrength Devastator squadron. But we have a few of those in stock, so we can kind of replace those uh, or fill it out pretty easily. Uh, so that's the carrier fleet as it stands right now. Uh, we mentioned the American carrier that's coming. There's also some British carriers that are... Blah, 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 blah. Ship availability. Um, U.S. Navy. And then leave the British. So you can see here we have some British carriers that are in route as well. Uh, let's hide everything but the carriers. Let's ETA them to the top. So in about a little less than a month, we'll have the Indomitable, the first of the British carriers. And then in about two and a half months, we'll have the Formidable. Um, so we'll have between the U.S.'s four carriers and the British's two carriers. Uh, in, well, actually, we'll have five American carriers within two and a half months. We'll have two British. We'll have a total of seven carriers. Now, the problem is the British carriers, eh, they're not as good. Uh, they're more durable. They have armored flight decks. Um, and they have a uh, vastly superior anti-aircraft complement, more than double uh, what the Enterprise has right now. But they only come with 12 fighters, 12 dive bombers, and 12 more fighters. And I'll, or maybe these are torpedo bombers, but essentially 21 fighters and 12 strike aircraft. And their air wings are not very uniform. Like you can see the American lay layout is pretty standard. You can see between these two carriers, I don't know what the Martlet is. I think it's a bomber. The Albacore is a bomber. Like they've got really weird, aircraft uh, sort of uh, complements in them. So we'll have to think about that as, as things uh, progress. Meanwhile, we're going to leave the carriers here this turn. We've got the fleet oilers heading south. The carriers are going to kind of chill around and just, just hang out. You know, their fuel situation's good. Um, they're at 85. Uh, their destroyers, eh, they could probably use a little bit more fuel. But um, nonetheless, they're in reasonable shape. We've got this oilers that are coming down that will kind of hang out around. And then we've got uh, some additional troops that are coming this way. Where are our troops? Um, these guys? Yes. So we've got the 164th in Infantry Regiment on its way to Savi. And then we've got the 119th Base Force with the two uh, Marine Squadrons that we mentioned on their way to Pago Pago to make the Japanese on the island of Savi's life a living nightmare. Speaking of them, they took the island last turn, and there are several ships spied out here, potentially some destroyers and cruiser mine layers. We have our own surface action group, definitely superior to destroyers or cruiser mine layers. It consists of two heavy cruisers, the Louisville and the Pensacola, two light cruisers, the Leidender and the Achilles. Uh, both the Leidender and the Achilles have already engaged. Uh, actually, just the... No... Uh, Yes, they have. They sank the AMC. So these are the New Zealand light -like cruisers that sank the AMC, but still have a reasonable amount of ammo left. And then the Voyager Destroyer, which is part of the Australian Navy, and also the La Trumpet, which is part of the New Zealand Navy. So this task force, two heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, two destroyers. The rule of two is going to go on max speed for the island of Savi to try and catch these transports and potentially destroyers as they're finishing unloading supplies at Savi, maybe we can destroy a Japanese task force easily and make the Japanese think twice. Meanwhile, in addition to that, we've got our task force up here with the 111th United States Navy Base Force on its way to the island of Canton, which we've had multiple recon flights over and indicated that this island is empty. There is no one on it. So with no one being on the island, we want to take it back and reassert ourselves in this part of the Pacific and maybe throw the Japanese for a loop. We have spotted some ships to the west moving southeast. Uh, these are apparently, there's at least one destroyer and there are three ships moving this way. But I think this task force of uh, one heavy cruiser and three destroyers can certainly deal with a lone Japanese destroyer, if that's all they have. Um, and we're landing on Canton. So Baker Island's also empty. We should probably put some troops there, but I don't have anyone to do that right now. So we're just going to land these troops on Canton. Or Canton. Um, Fiji, meanwhile, more troops have arrived. You can see here we've got about 3,500 more troops that need to unload uh, and a reasonable amount of supply, uh, about, what is that, 8,000 supply uh, coming ashore here uh, to strengthen. Meanwhile, we're moving the 7th Brigade to the west to Nadi uh, to reinforce the Nadi troops. Uh, the Nadi troops. Um, and uh, make sure that he doesn't want to land on either spot on the island of Fiji. Uh, meanwhile, the Queen Elizabeth is loading up the 1st Australian Brigade and will be heading to Suva soon. 
uh, and we've got some other transports on their way to Sydney so that we can pick up the Coastal Defense Battalion and move it uh, to uh, Fiji as well. We also have this uh, Australian Infantry Battalion moving to Nomaya to reinforce the, the garrison there. And we've got a bunch of ships moving around east of Pearl. We've got a lot of fuel starting to come in, which I think is good. We definitely need, you know, the 66,000 fuel here, the 36,000 fuel here. We need to build up a stockpile of fuel in the Pago Pago, uh, Fiji region. We're moving a lot of ships around. We're moving some ships at full speed. We don't have the logistical infrastructure to support it. We do have a, a tanker back here, kind of for emergency purposes. Uh, the Australian tanker Bishtapal uh, with 3,500 fuel. That will be able to help anybody in a crisis out. We have these heavy cruisers, uh, the Canberra, uh, heading back to Sid Sydney. These guys just successfully destroyed uh, one, potentially two Japanese destroyers and a Japanese patrol boat uh, near the island of Fi uh, Fiji. Uh, and then we've got a second fleet oiler on the way, but only carrying 4,400 supply of fuel. So uh, that's enough to let me sort of bare bones it. Uh, we're close enough to Australia that we can kind of manage for some of our units, but certainly not naval mu units moving around at full strength, or sorry, full speed. Um, not a lot else happening other than our chain of logistical support for Australia is finally about to arrive. You can see there's 6,800 fuel on this task force, 36,000 in this, 14,000 there, 5,000 there, 18,000 there. Uh, and then we've got some other tankers headed back to the Dutch East Indies. Speaking of the Dutch East Indies, we've turned off oil production at Palembang, which means that the fuel levels will remain about f about flat, but the oil levels are going up. Uh, I guess that's good in the sense that any oil that he transports back to the home islands. One, he's got to transport it via convoy. Two, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a delay. He's not immediately getting the fuel, which would be the case if we put it through the refinery, but the refinery is off. Since we're in uh, I'm going to lose my breath here. Since we're in the Malay Peninsula, I'm going to talk about my plan this turn. First off, I've got some additional reinforcements heading north to uh, Mersing. I've got the 3rd Cavalry Regiment, which consists of some armored cars, is my understanding. Uh, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to throw two Japanese units of about 3,500 troops into the sea. Um, I thought about shock attacking these guys, but I think I'm actually going to go ahead and do a deliberate attack, mainly because I don't want to lose excessive casualties if this was in China, I would shock attack in a heartbeat because you have a better chance of overrunning the enemy. The problem is if you fail, you take massive casualties. And this is 326 uh, assault value in Mersing. I don't want to lose that to a huge amount of destroyed because all that's left at Johar Baru is 150 assault value. And all that's at Singapore right now is 450 assault value. So between all of those three bases, uh, what you're looking at is you're looking at about 926 assault value. When you compare that to the Philippines and Bataan, uh, they've already got 1,000 just in Bataan. Uh, in Manila, there's another 173. In Clark Field, there's another 546. Uh, you know, the uh, Philippine army uh, d uh, fighting against the Japanese has in excess between all the units that can still fall back into uh, the Bataan per uh, perimeter. Uh, the uh, Philippine forces there have around 1,900 assault value, uh, well more, almost triple what we have in Singapore. And that's despite the fact that we're going to be facing off against, I think, very similar numbers. So we need to make sure that we kind of strengthen that. Um, meanwhile, we're moving some of these troops back uh, to uh, Telamu uh, and also some of these troops over of the 22nd Indian Brigade to try and strengthen that uh, fortress Singapore. So we've got about 98 in the 3rd uh, Indian Brigade. The 8th has 58, also has a fair number of units that can kind of rest, replenish, and maybe uh, get some of their assault value back. But about another 130 assault value would be in uh, Singapore if I could pull those troops back, which would be great because it would uh, bring us, you know, a lot. I think it would improve our odds. Meanwhile, we're pulling our submarines back to kind of this sort of uh, an arc defense here from about Kutan south toward Kuching. Uh, so we're moving our subs into position. We're definitely using, that, using them somewhat operationally. Um, but in addition to attacking at Mersing, so I've shown you I'm going to attack with a deliberate attack. In addition to that, I'm also going to pound the position first before I actually attack. So if you take a look here, you can see we have 189 aircraft at Singapore. 
what we're going to do is we're going to order the 20 bombers that are ready to fly uh, to bomb uh, the enemy troops there, the ground troops here. So, for example, these B-17s are going to fly in at 10,000 feet. They're going to ground attack at Mersing. So they're going to drop their payload of eight 500-pound bombs on the Japanese troops at Mersing. In addition to that, I'm going to get our good old friends, the biplanes, into action here as well. Uh, I'm also going to uh, issue orders to the uh, 31 torpedo bombers at Singapore to bomb the Japanese troops at Mersing uh, in an effort to soften them up for the eventual attack by our forces so that we can minimize our casualties. In addition to those aircraft that we have at Singapore, we're also going to be launching a, a substantial force north of Singapore at Jojo Harbaru, uh, or not Jojo, it's Johar Baru, or however you pronounce that. Uh, but we've got about 19 ready aircraft here that are going to bomb. Um, we also have the Belgian, or sorry, Dutch bombers out of uh, Meden here, about 21 that are going to fly there. Uh, on the northern tip of Borneo, we've got an additional 21 aircraft. Uh, about 13 of those are ready bombers, which are also going to fly uh, to Mersing. And all of these aircraft are going to converge on Mersing in an effort to obliterate the Japanese defenders uh, before our infantry even attacks. Not just the bombers, though. We're going to send one, or actually... 89 fighter aircraft, the H-81, A-3, basically a P-40 variant, uh, the 39 uh, Buffaloes that are currently ready for service, the 24 P-40 Warhawks. We're setting everybody to 100 feet. They're going to go in. They're going to strafe. They're going to drop 500-pound bombs on the enemy. And hopefully, when it's all said and done, they're going to destroy the resistance so that we can overrun the Japanese. Now, if you remember back to the first turn when XTRG launched a strafing strike at 100 feet against Pearl Harbor, you're probably saying, wait a minute, THG, don't do that. You're going to get your fighters shot to pieces. You might be right, but... I think we have two key advantages. One, we own the base at Mersing, so there's no flak as part of the base. Two, we're facing off against, I believe, either a Naval Guard unit or an SNLF force that he fast transported in. I don't think either of those units ever comes with anti-aircraft guns, so if they're shooting the rifles at our aircraft, I'm not too worried about flying in low. In addition to that, uh, I think there's a remnant of an infantry battalion, which might have some anti-aircraft. But unless he's transported more troops in under our noses, he should have no anti-aircraft gunnery here. Now, the risk we're taking is that he has a fighter patrol over Mersing, and the prudent thing would be to sweep the area first before we send our bombers in and our fighters in strafing. I'm not doing that, one, because I want the element of surprise, two, because over the last two turns, his aircraft really have kind of taken a back seat uh, to focusing on anti-submarine warfare. So I think I can surprise him if I send my fighters in. And again, that's over 80 fighters uh, flying in with light bombs and strafing the enemy troops near Mersing. So I think that can work well for us. So those are the two big call-outs this turn. Uh, I'm kind of at 30 minutes already, so I don't want to make this video too long. But So we looked at the fighter squadrons on our carriers. Uh, we looked at the attack that's going to be taking place, potentially, assuming he doesn't withdraw, with two heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and two destroyers uh, moving in against his ground troops at Savi. We showed that our air groups are over here and still remain undetected. We've got a whole bunch of convoys moving through the area. And one other thing. Kwajalein Island, which is a major Japanese naval base, we got a recon flight over there, and guess what, guys? We saw three fleet carriers, six fleet carriers, two battleships, and one light cruiser, 37 fighters, 160 bombers, four auxiliaries. It's 47 range, whatever that is. This is Kitty Butai. Assuming this intelligence is correct, this is Kitty Butai. And I'm guessing there's more than six ships there. But um, this is important. We've identified where the Japanese are. Now, we knew they were over by Midway uh, about two turns ago, so they must have booked it back at near full speed to Kwajalein. That probably means they're refueling this turn. They're probably going to take at least one more turn before they move. If they take one turn before they move, then they're going to take two to three turns to get down here, which means we have three to four turns before we have to worry about the carriers even getting close. Uh, our carriers are going to remain still this turn, uh, and then over the next two turns, they'll probably move to around here, uh, or maybe here, and then we'll sprint them in on turn three, bomb Savi in turn four, when the Japanese potentially could be coming into the area. We're going to run south uh, and probably hide at the southern tip of uh, New Zealand. And uh, that'll give our aircraft carriers some experience bombing enemy troops and hopefully increase their dive bomber experience if we bomb the Japanese at Savi, which I think is my plan. 
Uh, that all assumes that we remain hidden and that he doesn't know our carriers are here, but so far there's been no recon flights over our carriers. So we're going in to land on, so or on Canton Island. We're kind of continuing to hide our carriers. We're waiting for some of our other troops to move forward. We have one infantry regiment and one marine regiment on the way to the Fiji line. Um, and uh, we'll at least put one of them in, in Pago Pago. We may counterattack with the other in Savi. Or we may leave it in like Fiji or New Caledonia. So uh, out of breath now. That is our turn for the most part. One other thing I did want to call out in China, central China, just to the south of Nanjing, uh, one Japanese unit moved into a hex of ours. This hex of ours has five uh, Chinese infantry corps and the 23rd Group Army headquarters. So this is a very potent uh, Chinese unit. 400, 826 assault value, not a ton of supply, but we're going to go ahead and shock attack these Japanese. My hope is that there's no additional troops coming into the hex next turn. If it's not, even if it's a full Japanese division, I think we can deal with it. Or uh, certainly if it's a Japanese brigade, we can deal with it. Uh, that assault value would be double anything that the Japanese would have in a full division, most likely. And that full division probably would not be uh, as effective uh, if they're attacked, uh, I don't think. So we're going to launch a shock attack against these guys, uh, and then we're going to continue to stand down our P-40s over here till we get the squadron backed up to strength. So that's the situation. Do we have anything else? Like, Do I have anywhere else I can aviation support? He keeps bombing these troops. Is there anywhere we can fly out of? I don't think I have any way to protect these troops. Uh, air capacity 3, aviation support 25. Can we get them to Wen Kao? Nice! All right, let's try this. Let us uh, do a long range cap with these aircraft, these 16 aircraft, over our unit here. The Again, he keeps bombing with no fighter escorts, mind you. He keeps bombing our troops here, the 70th Chinese Corps. All we're trying to do is retreat. We're at uh, 39 miles. So I'm going to try and put my fighters based out of Wang Kao, which is a level 3 airfield with 25 aviation support on the coast. Uh, this is a, a very good uh, facility. Uh, that would be a great port for us to pump supplies into China if, one, it wasn't almost cut off by the Japanese, and two, it also has industry, two, if it wasn't suicide trying to get people there. Uh, but for the moment, we're going to leverage the fact that we've got a good airfield on the coast here, uh, and we're going to run cap and hope he attacks our 70th Chinese Corps with no uh, no combat air patrol, or no escorts. Can we move these guys too? It'd be great. Their, their fatigue's a bit higher, so I was trying to stand them down. Oh, we can. Um, their fatigue is higher, but let's do this. Long range cap. I'm really hoping he attacks these guys. He's attacked them, I think, the last several turns. He's bombed them north of Fuchao more than once. So it might be a nice chance for us to get some cheap kills on Japanese pilots and kill some pilots, which is always a, a good thing. Uh, we want to put as much stress on his training program as possible. Anyway, so I guess four big things then. Large-scale uh, combat air patrol over Fu uh, near Fuchao with our fighters. Um, we have... Uh, some battles going on here south of, what is the city, Nanjing, uh, with our large Chinese force here. Uh, we are going to be attacking uh, Mersing, and we're going to be bombing it with absolutely everything, including fighters that we can bring to bear. Uh, fighters out of Singapore, fighters out of Johar Bahru, fighters out of Maiden, fighters out of Swing Kang. Everything that we can bring to bear is going to hit these guys before our troops attack at Mersing. And then we're going to be launching a naval attack on Savi. If his, if his ships stick around, mind you, they may leave. But if they stick around with two heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and two destroyers. And on top of all of that, we're hoping for an unopposed landing of a base force unit on Canton Island trying to retake our first possession from the Japanese. That's all we have on, on, on cap here for December 32nd. Oh my god, words, words, dates, things. December 23rd, uh, the day before Christmas Eve. So maybe it's an early Christmas present. We'll see, but there's going to be a lot of action in our next combat results, so stay tuned next time.
to find out what happens. That's it for this summary, this episode. It's a bit of a long one. I appreciate you tuning in. But until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching. And until next time, I'm out. Oh, guys, shit, I forgot. One other thing. Um, the Prince of Wales. So the Prince of Wales, I think, is out of enemy air, air cover, air range, whatever. Uh, it's just south of the uh, city of Muntauk. Uh, it is currently here. Uh, it has taken a little bit more float damage. It's up to 60. It started with 51. So that's something we need to be mindful of. We're probably going to try and get it toward uh, Oosthaven and uh, repair that float up a little bit. We lost about 2 knots of speed. It had been moving at 9 knots. Now it's down to 7 due to the increased flooding. So we'll do some minor repairs at Oosthaven. You don't need a port to do basic repairs uh, of like float damage or system repair. Uh, probably spend three or four days here in ready status to get that down before we send it back to uh, Cape Town for repairs. In addition to that, the repulse is already on the way. We've switched it over to flank speed to get it there. 20 float damage, not too worried that anything too bad will happen and should get us much closer to the edge of the map and back to Cape Town. All right, guys, thanks again. That's it for this time. Until next time, the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.